Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today on this beautiful afternoon. Um, we'll be talking about planting herbs, whether it's in your garden or inside in your home. Um, I welcome questions uh, throughout our discussion. So if you pop it in the chat box, um, I'm happy to answer them uh, uh, through, through Mackenzie's help. Also want to thank Mackenzie for uh, hosting this webinar. So let me just start by talking about what is a herb. So herb is a very uh, general term that's used for, for, um, for different concepts. But what I'll talk about today are sort of plants where we eat um, the leaves or stems um, of mostly what are non-woody annuals. So woody plants are things that have bark and have sort of that hard uh, uh, stem structure. Um, some herbs that um, we eat are definitely woody. So things like bay laurel, or um, um, I guess I'm thinking about kaffir lime leaves, but the vast majority of things that we are able to grow in our gardens and so forth are things that, that uh, we, we uh, have alive for basically one season. And so the thing about herbs that makes them so fascinating both from a biological as well as a culinary perspective is that they're very fragrant and um, flavorful, hence we incorporate them into cuisines throughout the world. Um, part of why they are this way is because of the secondary chemical compounds in the plants. These are um, things that plants produce, um, sort of plants are thought of as like um, sort of living chemical factories that are uh, important for various um, aspects of plant life. So for example, scent is very important for attracting pollinators, but also a lot of these uh, chemical compounds signal that the plant is defending itself in some way chemically um, from, from herbivory. And um, it's, it's these um, chemicals that are often part of uh, what attracts us to these plants. So the things that we'll be talking about today are our everyday herbs such as uh, basil, oregano, uh, rosemary, thyme, um, as well as um, a, a, a variety of other herbs. So if you have a favorite herb that you want to talk about, um, please just let me know. So why grow herbs? Um, sort of from a just sort of a, a practical perspective. Definitely for myself, um, it is having access to sort of a diversity of fresh herbs, particularly in the summer that I can use for cooking, um, things that are not easily available in grocery stores. Um, some herbs that I particularly like are actually uh, locally unavailable. So you have a picture here of two different kinds of, um, of, of perilla leaves, one or shiso leaves. So the one on the bottom, the purple leaf is uh, used often in, in Japanese food to, to flavor um, uh, dishes such as pickles and, and just to eat raw. Uh, the top leaf is a uh, related plant called perilla leaf. And this is, uh, from my experience anyways, used in Korean food where you uh, harvest and, and pickle these leaves um, in sort of like a, a spicy sauce. And you'd eat that with rice. So these are things that I grow because I can't find them at the grocery stores. And, and sort of uh, I, I, I acquired some seeds um, years ago. And I collect the seeds, and so I can produce these plants at home. And and one of the things that's really interesting is that um, if you go to various um, uh, sort of ethnic grocery stores as well as just general grocery stores, you find a wide variety of plants that are um, that you can grow and maybe are familiar to you that you just won't find in a, a, even a big grocery store or supermarket. And it's of course like really part of what's exciting is that that we are able to grow what we eat. And um, that connection for myself is, is, one, is just um, something that gives me a joy to, to grow something and eat it. And um, I also just think it's fascinating to watch the life cycle of a diversity of plants um, in my garden or in my home. And um, that's just sort of the fun of growing herbs. So let me just start by outlining in a very broad and general sense, the, the annual life cycle of herbs. So you start with seed, 
And, and, and this is sort of approximate timing for a lot of the, the herbs that we'll be talking about today, like things like basil, um, uh, thyme, oregano. If you uh, plant the seeds, germination takes between five to 12 days, um, generally. Um, it it uh, produces a little seedling. If you look at the bottom left here, that's extremely tiny. And it takes a long time for that basil plant, in this case here, uh, to grow to a size that uh, I, I feel comfortable starting to harvest it. And so in Edmonton, I find that it is about one to two months. And uh, so if you were to take it from seed, and at some point, um, of course, the one of the prime directives of any plant is to reproduce. And so it will um, uh, bolt, which is uh, producing a reproductive stem and flower. And so one of the important things about this process of flowering is that it often starts to uh, slow down the production of the leafy matter that we like to eat as a herb. And so unlike many of our plants that we find in our garden that we produce or we we culture for, for the flowers themselves. In many cases, for, for the uh, purpose of edible herbs, we like to suppress or delay flowering as much as possible so that we can have that vegetative growth that uh, we, we harvest. So, so that sort of goes into the thinking of how we um, um, maintain and, and sort of uh, schedule the, the pruning and harvesting of the plants that we grow. And so, the reason this life cycle is really important is, of course, it sort of uh, uh, determines how we might think about how we're going to, to, to consume the herbs that we're producing, presumably. You can uh, produce uh, herbs for fun, but, but assuming that you're going to eat them, you sort of have to sort of think about how you might um, consume these, uh, these plants over the course of a season. And to that end, um, Oh, sorry, I forgot to show you some pictures of bolting. So if you look on the top right here, this is a bolting basil plant. And then here, um, if you look on the bottom left and right, this is a cilantro plant and you can see it flowering. And so when you see the flowers, it actually sort of um, gives you a sense that, oh, don't these kind of leaves kind of look like carrot tops? And indeed the cilantro plant is related to uh, the carrot plant that we eat, whereas the, the basil is sort of related to the whole mint family that's uh, very dominant in our herbal uh, landscape. So the reason we need to think about these life cycles is that it helps us sort of plan, um, perhaps maximize our, our herb production over the course of the season. Um, so this is just to introduce the idea of successional planting, um, sort of from a practical point of view, um, it's nice to think about um, when um, the, the plants will mature and can be harvested. In Edmonton, we have a relatively short summer, but a very beautiful and intense summer. And so, uh, for example, a lot of things can just be planted now outside and, um, and sort of just to maximize output. But there are things such as lettuce and arugula and spinach where, where I would like to have a harvest sort of uh, throughout the summer where I might space out plantings um, to every two weeks. So I might take a plot or a pot, um, such as you see on the, on the right-hand side there, and I would prepare the, the um, um, plot um, perhaps this weekend, and I would just start seeding maybe every week or every two weeks so that I have uh, fresh uh, material for the uh, duration of the summer. And so people who take this very seriously sort of make a little calendar like this. Um, but um, I, personally, I just do it in my head. But, but it's, it's good to think about that sort of planting because otherwise, um, in my past experience, I've planted a lot of lettuce all at once. And then you have uh, way more lettuce than, than you can eat at once and, and uh, no lettuce at other times of the summer. So let's talk a little bit about um, picking your plants. Um, this is sort of uh, a decision that is personal to each of us. Uh, definitely thinking uh, when I go to a, a, like a seed store or something, um, I, I see the whole variety of seeds, but I've found that it's, it's, it's just good to reflect upon um, what kind of herbs that I personally like to use um, with it on a regular basis, because uh, that's, that's just sort of practically speaking, I've had things like thyme, which I like, but 
I don't usually use. And so I've had lots of time without um, much experience using it. Uh, you can also find plants in seedling form, as you see on the left-hand side. Um, these are plants that have uh, already been germinated from seed and grown um, by uh, horticulturalists and growers um, to a size that is obviously far um, in advance of starting by seed. And so uh, this is nice because you have the advantage of having a plant that is um, um, uh, far more along its sort of like life cycle than if you start by seed. There's sort of all other sources. So um, sources uh, for this material such as seed and, and seedlings obviously are, are places like garden centers, local ones uh, are, are really stocked right now. Uh, grocery stores, hardware stores are, are stocked with all sorts of seedling material. Um, seeds are probably found in greatest diversity at uh, specialized um, uh, growing places like um, locally, well, I'm not affiliated with any of these places, but like places like, like Apache Seed or, or Salisbury Greenhouse have like a wide range of seeds. What's also a really great source of, of um, herbs, it, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in a second, is that you can propagate uh, herbs from cuttings Things that you may just have purchased from the grocery store can actually be harvested and then uh, 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 replanted so that they continue to grow over the course of the season. Also, something I found out about uh, recently is the seed library at the Edmonton Public Library, the downtown branch. And so this is sort of a very nice system where the community can share seeds with other members of the community and um, you can you can uh, quote unquote borrow seeds in other words you get them for free as well as you can contribute seeds if you have too many and um, I also find that this is a great uh, sort of process even on a on a neighbor basis where you can just trade with your friends or neighbors um, extra seeds that uh, you may have for seeds that you don't have so let me just sort of in a general sense uh, talk about growing um, these herbs indoors versus outdoors. Uh, in Edmonton, um, our, our, we don't live in California where you could grow outdoors year round. Um, and so uh, obviously the benefit of growing indoors is that you can have year round growing of fresh uh, material. It's very convenient because it's in your house. Um, this, this winter, I left just a pot of soil um, uh, in my kitchen and I would just jab uh, various uh, plants that I had leftover stems from, and um, some would grow, some wouldn't, but I could harvest uh, fresh material throughout the winter that way. Um, overall, it's more challenging to grow things indoors, even next to a window, because um, the light indoors, even though it may seem bright to our eyes, does not have um, the sort of uh, um, uh, like photon density or another, it's the intensity of light um, that you find uh, outdoors, even when it seems shady and, and uh, relatively dark, the outdoors uh, has a, a lot more um, light, in, particularly in the summer. Um, the other sort of practical limitations are things like limited space. But having said that, um, it's, it's uh, something that you can, you can grow some herbs and, and um, enjoy throughout most of the year or year round. So one of the things that uh, I know a lot of people are interested in doing is to sort of try to get a, a head start on the growing season is that you may have already grown plants from seed or from, from seedlings uh, indoors, and you'd like to now move them outdoors to, to, to get the full benefit of the sun. And so this is actually a surprisingly um, um, uh, dangerous process or risk. Um, risky process for plants because they need a little bit of time to acclimate to the intensity of light that is available outdoors. And so um, I've had sort of um, sort of past failures where I've grown stuff indoors. And even though I'm aware of the need to acclimate and, and, and took my time doing it, uh, you just find that sometimes plants burn. And so this is um, one reason why I, I do prefer to just actually start um, by growing plants outside. Um, but having said that, 
Uh, I have had success too growing uh, plants indoors and, and moved them outdoors and, and started with bigger plants. And the key to this is sort of really uh, gradually making this transition. And so um, it, it's it's kind of depending on how, how many plants you have, it's, it's a lot of work, but you at first move your indoor plants outdoors for maybe one or two hours um, in the shade to uh, give the plant a bit of an opportunity to to acclimate to the um, higher uh, levels of light and then increase this over a period of one week or two weeks. Um, if you have a, a sort of a, a window in a garage or something that gets exposure, that's a good transition place as well. Um, but it, uh, it may take quite a while for the plant uh, to, to acclimate to being outside. And, and part of this is that um, um, sort of the, the the photosynthetic structures in the plant are, are sort of acclimated or, or adjusted to, to different levels of light. And it just takes time to, to make that change as you go from a relatively low light regime to a, a very uh, uh, intense outdoor regime. So for the most part, I'm gonna uh, focus on growing plants outdoors and uh, I was just saying to Mackenzie that this year the weather's looking good. I'm just going to go for it uh, this week and this weekend, um, putting stuff outside. Um, there's always a risk um, pretty much until mid-May in Edmonton that we may get um, some sort of uh, frost or, or cold, but um, it, it's sort of, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it, it's a risk that I'm taking this year. Um, thinking about where to grow plants and herbs outdoors, really like it's important to just think about the basic things that are important for a plant. So light, um, water, um, of course we can modify the amount of water by, by, um, by using uh, our, our city water to, to supplement, um, but it, it does help to have a place where the plants are naturally watered whenever um, it, it rains and so forth. Wind is sometimes an important thing for, for potted plants because just uh, when it gets really windy, they physically get blown over or blown off a, um, a balcony or something. And so it's just good to give a little consideration as to where uh, the plants are placed. Usually on the ground, like at, on the ground level, um, it, it's not that windy, um, even at the worst of times. And so um, that's a, obviously a safe place. Uh, I think an important and underrated thing about where you put your herbs, and obviously we're looking at a picture of containers, but um, that can be moved. Um, but even sort of in placing them in the ground is actually convenience. And so for me, uh, I'm not sure if I'm extra lazy or something, but if the herb is like way sort of in the back of the garden, if I'm in the middle of cooking, sometimes I don't want to walk over to get the plant uh, to use. And, um, and that's just me. But, but if it's literally sitting outside uh, my door, then it's really easy to get. And so it's, it's sort of important to think about um, where... Uh, you can access these plants, um, I guess in also in terms of watering, but but for me, like so, sort of like I like to use them uh, if anything. And we'll talk a little bit about that in terms of getting clippings and stuffing like that or and cuttings so that we can you can actually do a bit of both, uh, put some indoors as well as outdoors. One other thing is a, uh, the location of structure. So not everybody has to deal with this, but um, for a wall, uh, outdoor garage wall I have that's south facing, I find that it just gets extremely hot near that wall. And so um, I would definitely um, not put a lot of my herbs there because I think it just gets too hot, like temperature wise, um, as well as uh, perhaps maybe too much full sun. And so thinking about where uh, the structures are sort of that give you a little bit of shade in the course of the day is uh, sort of an important consideration. Um, we'll talk about it more, but about six to eight hours of full sun is, I think, um, a, a nice amount. But our days in the winter, or sorry, in the summer are, are obviously, what are they, like 16 hours long. And so having a little bit of shade um, might be actually beneficial for the plants. So having said that, um, just sort of to go back, jump back to thinking about the indoors, we really do want as much light as possible. Um, like I said, it's not uh, obvious through our eyes that 
that it's so much darker indoors because it our eyes are so good at adjusting to different light levels but but in many cases even sort of in a self facing window the light that you get through a window can be five to 10 times less than uh, outdoors. And so this is just something to consider in terms of uh, um, um, growing your plants and the light availability. One thing also about the indoor environment is that the light is generally directional. It, it comes typically from the south side. And so the plants will always grow to the light. And so it's good to turn your containers once or twice a week. Um, I mean, there's no hard, fast rule, but that helps them from bending over. And in Edmonton, I do think that if you're really serious about uh, getting good, good, healthy growing plants, that it, it is nice to have some supplemental lighting to, uh, to help them grow. So when growing herbs, um, one of the, I guess, the big debates is whether uh, you should uh, grow them in containers or in the ground. Um, I, I don't think there's a there's a right answer. Everybody's uh, yard or um, the space they have available is different. What I like about containers, obviously, is that you can grow them anywhere. If you have a little window ledge outside or a little balcony, um, even steps to your your door. Um, if you live in an apartment, you can grow in containers very successfully. But even if you have a big yard, uh, there are a lot of pros to growing in a container. It's definitely easier to control the soil conditions because you're focused on a small uh, unit of, of uh, area. And so you can um, uh, keep a good um, track of how much water is in the soil and so forth. Um, what's also nice is that plants at different cycles in their, uh, of their life um, might require different amounts of, of things like light. And you can adjust that in containers by just moving them around um, from more shade to more sun. Um, definitely there's less weeding when you have it in a container because obviously there's less um, uh, invasion from, from uh, the surrounding soil. Of course, there's still seeds that fall in from your yard, and but those are easy to pick out usually. Um, one issue when you're thinking about growing things that that uh, grow um, sort of through the soil, things like um, mint, is that sometimes if you don't place your mint in the right place, it really can become a weed and you can have unwanted spreading of things like um, lemon balm, mint. Um, I find my chives are, are pretty aggressive and um, and the other thing is that it's sometimes easier to, to manage disease in a container because you have a sort of distinct unit that is uh, not connected to the rest of the, the rest of the garden. Um, containers can be of all sorts of shapes and sizes. I just wanted to, to sort of show you um, uh, a little picture of something I like to do sometimes, which is just like put holes in, in whatever containers are, are um, in your life. Uh, yogurt containers I have way too many of. And so if you put a few holes, um, then you can make an uh, infinite number of containers and you can even use the lids as, as trays. Um, and so this is uh, certainly a way to, to, to reuse um, sort of products that sort of come into your life, uh, but also just to, to, to um, exemplify that a lot of this stuff can be done on um, yeah, with anybody. And if you have a bunch of, of kids that you want to have a, a planting party for, then you can use something like this and then they can take it home um, and, and continue to grow their herbs in their, in their garden. So the downside um, to containers is that sometimes, depending on the container type and depending on the, the weather, um, you can have extremely fast change in conditions. In other words, if it's really hot, uh, even a, a pretty big pot dries out um, relatively quickly. And so you might have to react a little faster. Um, also, if you're really into, so I was showing you those perilla leaves and the shiso, um, uh, I just, I want a lot of them. And so um, just having a bunch of little containers is, is a lot of work. And so I have um, a, boxes that I just grow a huge amount of them in. 
And um, for things that are perennial, like so uh, garlic chives here, you see on the top top right here, as well as things like mint, um, I, I've put them in uh, parts of the garden that they can just grow uh, without sort of interfering with other plants. And uh, because they just come back every year, uh, that's a it's a great um, great plant because it's very low effort and um, and yeah and I get a lot of productivity. So things like where my mint is, um, it's definitely not just sort of connected to to the entirety of the garden. It, the, it I sort of have it in a place where it's it's essentially blocked off by the garage as well as sort of concrete uh, pavement, and so it has its own little zone where it. It sort of generally stays. So the next question in terms of growing herbs is always, should you use seedlings or cuttings or should you start from seed? And so going back to that uh, herb life cycle, there's just no getting around the fact that seeds take longer. So if it takes, let's say 10 to 14 days to germinate, and then it takes another um, month and a half to get to the size of the plants that you can buy um, at uh, a, a nursery, then you're basically behind two and a half months. And in Edmonton, that's kind of almost half of our summer. And so uh, there's no getting around the fact that the seedlings are, are sort of gonna get you going faster. Um, having said that, um, Many plants, including the perilla leaf, but but also just like a whole bunch of uh, um, uh, different herbs, are are simply not available locally as seedlings. And so um, seeds have the benefit that you can order them um, throughout uh, Canada uh, relatively easily. Um, they're they're really large seed supply stores. Um, once again, not not personally invested, but like places like Stokes. There's this place called Richter's in Ontario that I've ordered from where they have um, endangered plant seeds and herbs, as well as like sort of a wide variety of seed plants or plants that are in seed form that, that I just wouldn't be able to find here. And so um, that diversity just, I mean, I, I grow them partly just for fun, um, but uh, is, is something that you will not see in seedlings. And so uh, uh, that's, yeah, I have no choice but to, to, to grow them from seed. And um, so my sort of general approach is to use both. Um, I use seedlings, um, particularly early, like right now-ish, to, to get my garden looking more green and less brown. Um, but then I also start, I would start my seeds right now so that in a few weeks and a few months, then I would have like the variety that those seed plants offer. And so, um, I think that, um, yeah, I, I mean, obviously it, it's up to each person and sort of also a, a different level of, of investment in the time to, to grow your herbs. Starting from seed definitely requires a higher level of maintenance, particularly at first, um, and, um, just because you want to make sure things like the soil aren't drying out. You might have to transplant um, uh, additionally, but uh, buying from, uh, uh, from a nursery will allow you to just get going and and start eating that basil pretty soon. Um, cuttings are also, uh, we'll talk about that more in a second, but cuttings are where you take a, a clip of a, um, a mature plant and then you might try to propagate from that. So on some level, it's very similar to a seedling, but cuttings don't, uh, because you're cutting the stem, don't have the roots already developed that the seedlings would. And so they're sort of intermediate, I guess, in terms of how long it takes. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. So herbs in general, once again, generalizing, uh, like, like to uh, grow in relatively well-draining soils. And so potting mixes are, are, um, that are readily available are, are good um, products to use. They don't actually necessarily have a lot of soil in them. They have a lot of uh, different things that are combined, like vermiculite, coco guar, like to, to make this, the substrate that you grow the plant in. Um, if you want to use soil, then uh, sort of a, a sandy loam. So there's like a high, high percentage of sand as opposed to the finer particles of, of silt and, um, and clay would be good because 
uh, you want to have pretty good drainage overall um, so that the roots don't um, sort of soak in water, especially if you're outdoors and if it rains, um, it's hard to, to get those pots to drain after the rain. Um, typically, the, once again, no hard, fast rule, but I like to think sort of six to eight inches is the minimum for a pot, um, just because um, a lot of these herbs get pretty big over the course of the summer. So when you start at the beginning of summer and the basil plant is like a couple of millimeters, it's it's hard to envision how it's going to use up a pot that's that's uh, um, what, six to eight inches deep in soil. But um, over the course of the sort of following months, you'll find that uh, indeed they do get really big. So uh, that you can approach differently. Um, some people like transplanting, so I'll, we'll talk a little bit about that in a second, but like start transplanting small seedlings. But if you want to, you're willing to upgrade the size of the pots over the course of the season, then, then um, you certainly don't have to start with a very deep um, soil depth uh, at first, but we'll have to modify that over the course of the season. So this is how I like to um, plant seeds as far as herbs. Um, whatever container you use, so I just I uh, have a picture of a terracotta pot I fill with the, the potting mix. Um, the key thing, uh, and we'll talk about starting in, in, in seedling trays, is to just soak the water. This, uh, for germinating seeds, I guess I think of the, the biggest threat as uh, sort of them uh, germinating and then being in dry soil and then just desiccating and dying very quickly. So I like to just completely soak the water make sure the top as well as sort of the middle layers are wet. Um, a lot of times you'll start to see the water drain from the bottom when it starts to, to get really soaked, um, but you also wanna just check and make sure it's really wet. Um, you can maybe poke a little hole, like very, almost just like a depression, three millimeters is, is a tiny amount because you don't really want the seeds too deep. And then I place the seeds in the hole. So the seeds, at this point, I like to keep my hands really dry because, um, so the soil is completely wet, but I dry my hands because those seeds, a lot of them are very tiny and I wanna just be, have better control. Um, with other seeds like corn or beans or nasturtiums or sweet peas, I often will soak them so they, the seeds can imbibe water before I plant them. But with, um, with a lot of these small herb seeds, I find that that just makes every, like it just sticks to my hand and so, I like to just do that part dry, but that's obviously uh, just dependent on how patient you are. And then so place the seeds uh, in the holes and then I just move the um, soil surrounding just to cover it. Really don't wanna cover it too much um, because once again, uh, I want the, the, um, the plant to be able to, to surface the light as soon as possible. Having said that, you do wanna cover it otherwise, a little bit because otherwise it will dry out and it'll just sort of move. So one way, um, if you're um, keen on really um, growing a lot of particular plant, but having sort of a, a ability to optimize the growth is to use seedling trays. So you'd fill these trays with the same planting mix. You can uh, put it on that, uh, so that the, the seedling tray is that top bit there. And then on the bottom left is just like a, a tray that you put that seedling um, tray into, and you can fill that bottom bit with water, and it'll just slowly absorb that water through holes in, in the seedling tray um, to soak the soil. So that actually takes maybe 20 minutes just because um, the soil doesn't always absorb the water right away. But once it gets completely wet, uh, I would do the same process, but you can have a more controlled amount or number of seeds in each, um, each um, unit there. Usually one or two is enough. Like I find commercial seeds are, are very viable. In other words, a high percentage of them germinate. And so you don't usually have to put in too many seeds um, in, in each little slot to make sure there's something there. And then what's nice about different systems is that you can put a cover. If you look on the bottom right there, that is sort of just a clear cover that you can put on top of both the tray and the 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 the, the tray on the bottom as well as a seedling tray itself. And that uh, helps maintain uh, moisture while obviously letting in light. And so 
I think of the struggle um, at um, in that germination period as really just keeping the seeds um, moist enough that they can uh, uh, grow and um, after they've sprouted. Um, so the key with this is that once you have a plant that's uh, maybe a couple inches tall, then the the container itself, each unit is too small for um, for each plant to realize its its growth potential, and so you'd have to transplant them um, the plugs into a, a pot very similar to something you might have here or into the ground. And so in that case, you'd need to make a hole that's about the size of of the the plug, like each unit here. And then I would add water and then sort of transfer uh, the entire unit into the soil. And, and that's actually a really, uh, like because of these trays are, are really easy to get the, the plugs out, it, it's actually not very time consuming um, to do a whole bunch of plants in a short amount of time. So watering um, for herbs is probably the one uh, thing that, that we control the most that uh, could be good or bad for the plant. And so if I'm going to talk about watering in two phases, one before germination. So this is uh, specifically if we're growing from seed as opposed to transplanting seedlings or, or moving cuttings. Um, so the goal I think of in terms of germination is just to keep that soil surface moist. So you can imagine like if, if the seed is two millimeters uh, in size and it's buried three millimeters deep, its world is just that surface level of soil, right? So, so that top half centimeter of soil is what, what that, um, that plant has access to until it gets bigger. And so this is a very critical point where the surface actually does have to, I think anyways, like be relatively moist. You obviously don't want it soaking, um, but, um, and, and because the seeds in the ground or under the soil, it does not need, uh, um, light. Um, the process of germination takes place largely, well, in the absence of light. And so I like to keep the, the pots or containers or whatever in a half scenario, mostly just to keep uh, the warmth helps the germination and the early growth. Um, the hard part is watering these um, pots um, while before they've germinated, because one of the things about roots is that uh, not only are they important for the, the plant to to acquire water and, and nutrients from the soil, but they're incredibly important to just anchor the plant and uh, prevent it from tipping over or moving around um, um, when there are disturbances, just like uh, water on the surface. And so to that end, I like to, to not uh, disturb the soil surface, um, at least as much as possible. And so if you have a seedling tray like this, I would actually add water to that bottom left um, tray to sort of fill it maybe uh, one third of the way and let the individual pot units absorb that water from the bottom, which obviously would not disturb um, the seeds that are on that surface. So you can imagine like even pouring a little water will, will cause the, the soil surface to, um, to just, I guess, move around. You might end up with all the seeds in one part of your pot and, and none in the other. Um, which is fine. Like you can always fix things by moving plants around, but but um, but it's easier if they don't. Um, and so I would use maybe a mist bottle, just like a, any kind of mist bottle. Or if you're really doing this on a, a larger scale, uh, you could get one of these like ten dollar uh, mist nozzles. And so you attach that, and you can see on the in the picture in the middle there, it creates like a very fine mist. It's almost like misting with a mist bottle. I would still not point it at the soil because that. Uh, still has a lot of pressure. I would just sort of point it sort of at an angle and let the mist fall onto to, um, the, the uh, soil with the seeds um, planted. And that uh, will not disturb the soil because it's kind of just like it's misting um, from the top down. So the other thing um, uh, that needs to be done if you're starting from um, seedling or from cuttings uh, is the process of transplanting. So we, I think we talked about it a little bit, but um, one thing you'll notice if you just go to, this is actually, I think, a picture from Superstore um, where you can you can buy um, potted basil. And what you see is that it's, it's very densely planted. 
And in fact, the individual plants would do much better if they were given more space. So this is sort of like having a bunch of plugs, but all just in one uh, small container. And so what you can do is take the whole basil plant out of um, its pot, and you can sort of see on the, the bottom uh, right there on the right hand side, you can see that there are many stems of individual basils, and you can use your hands to slowly break up that root mass and uh, replant each um, basil stem. Um, so I think uh, um, uh, a good sort of change in, in uh, planting density would be to take that any size pot and then maybe double or triple the diameter and sort of put all the same plants back into a pot that's that's two or three times uh, bigger across and and it can be six to eight centimeters deep and so to do that uh, you do the same process um, where you would take soil put it in a pot wet it completely and then in this case because you have a uh, um, you have quite a lot of root I would actually use something like a little um, um, a wooden trowel or something just to make a hole and then um, then I can slide in the roots without um, smushing them as you plant them and then you just cover them at the top and and what you'll find is that uh, very quickly um, um, two things happen there's more space for each of the plants to grow its roots but also there's a bit more uh, better spacing between the individual stems so that there's uh, light access and and better productivity for each individual plant. So this sort of ties into this idea of density. And I don't think there's a right answer to this. On the right-hand side, you have a basil farm. And you can see how lush each individual plant is. And um, on the right, or sorry, on the left-hand side, you have just sort of potted basil, as you might see from a grocery store. And you'll definitely get good amounts of basil. Um, um, so it, it's sort of, on some level, just uh, how you prefer to grow your plants. Uh, it's certainly something in a pot that you wouldn't necessarily have a single stem. I find that there's greater productivity to at least have five to, to 10 stems, um, but that's certainly up to you. It's sort of, um, yeah, it, it's, it's, I guess, a, a style choice as far as how you want your basil to look. So um, outdoors, um, once you have uh, um, germinated the plants, um, in other words, so we're talking about watering, but we're talking about watering after uh, you see the green parts of the plants above ground. In other words, there's also roots below ground. So the soil surface can dry um, between waterings. Um, I, I sort of, uh, I sort of personally adjust like how much I water rather than how often I water because I just water every day, but but sort of based on your experience, you, you, I, I kind of want the surface to dry a little bit by the next day when I'm watering. Um, this will definitely change and you um, just have to adjust sort of uh, by eye to uh, what the temperature is like and, and how much uh, uh, sun there is. Obviously, if it's cloudy and raining, there's no watering required. Um, like in general, in Edmonton, I think six to eight hours of, of sun is ideal, but certainly it can be more. Um, it can be less and it, you'll just have sort of less productivity. Um, but having said that, sort of this idea of the soil surface drying a little bit, you don't want it too wet because it sort of starts promoting growth of bacteria and fungi if there isn't some amount of drying or, or even moss over the course of a, over a year. And, um, and so you, you, you I, I, I guess I would adjust how much I water each day so that by the time uh, the next day comes along, um, it, um, it's, it's a little dry. So one thing is that you definitely want to underwater rather than overwater because uh, for underwatering, if you start seeing the plant sort of wilt, you can just adjust by adding more water and it's not, it's stressful for the plants, but uh, it's usually not um, a, a fatal problem. Whereas if you overwater plant, if you um, sort of soak the roots so that they can't access oxygen or you're promoting too much fungal or pathogen growth in the soil, that can be um, sort of a fatal uh, flaw for your plants. And so it's definitely better to underwater than overwater if you are unsure about how much to water. So fertilizer is um, definitely something that uh, 
if, if you're really trying to maximize growth is important because any container or even uh, sort of a particular spot in your garden um, is a, a finite soil world. And so the plant growing takes in a lot of those nutrients and uh, will, will deplete them over the course of a season. Also in sort of container pots, um, you have, as you water, some sort of leaching out of the pot. And so you just sort of lose a little bit of the nutrient in the soil over time. And so um, depending on how productive your plants are, in other words, how much the, uh, the plant is growing um, above ground, uh, the, the more it's growing, the more nutrients it's using. So there are different kinds of fertilizer. Um, there's there are liquid forms that um, you can just add to, to your watering jug. Um, there's granular forms that you can just sort of sprinkle. Some are time released. In other words, um, they, they have slow time release. And so you can put on quite a bit without it um, um, burning, burning your plant. Um, and it sort of lasts longer, maybe a couple months in the soil if you sort of follow the instructions. They also sell things called sticks where you just put in the stick, which is also just a different form of a time release um, fertilizer. There are also natural ways where you can try to make compost teas. Uh, compost tea is essentially just a, a solution of compost sitting in water, and then you, um, you use that uh, to, to fertilize your, your plants. Regardless, overall, if you're trying to maximize the productivity of your plant or your growth of your plant, um, especially in a container, you will need to supplement not that often, like maybe every two or three weeks. Obviously, it depend on the kind of fertilizer, but just sort of as a general practice, I think that that's something uh, that is uh, good to do. Um, I prefer to do it many times in very low concentration because then you have sort of a um, um, ability to adjust the amounts. So in other words, rather than going at full concentration, let's say every two weeks, if that's what the the uh, um, the, the back of the box says, I would use it maybe at half concentration every week. Um, that's uh, and and if you're skeptical, like I think that it's a good opportunity to just try fertilizing some plants and not others, and just see if 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 uh, if it's having any impact on your growth, because it's certainly not uh, always necessary to to fertilize your plants, especially when they're very small. They don't take up a lot of nutrients from the soil. So let's talk a little bit about harvesting. And so this is actually one thing that um, is. Perhaps like sometimes it's just sad to be eating the plants that you've grown, but there are actually many benefits to harvesting. One of the key benefits is you, you need to actually harvest quite regularly to sort of delay the flowering. Otherwise, the plant sort of matures, produces flowers, and, um, and uh, the, the, the leafy growth sort of slows down or even entirely stops. And sometimes uh, the plants will actually, once they set seed, just sort of uh, senesce or die. Um, there's also another aspect to harvesting, particularly with plants like basils, and uh, we'll get into a bit more detail on this, but is to encourage branching um, and, um, and sort of the bushiness of a plant. So you actually have sort of a, a more productive plant because it's not straight growing up top, but it's, it's, it sort of uh, has a width to it. Um, one of the things that you can also do with harvesting is to sort of adjust the life cycle um, that we talked about earlier in the plant. So if you harvest at different times, you can, you can set plants that you perhaps started at the same time to different life stages. And so you can sort of uh, adjust that, that um, sequencing um, in that way. And so it, when you harvest, one of the things you can do is uh, at some point, like if you harvest a bunch of things and you want them fresh, you can just pop the harvested stem into water to extend the freshness. It could also become material, a cutting like that, to, um, to use uh, for propagating the plants. So once, if you leave it in water for a few days, you'll start to see roots. And if you put that into soil, then now you have, let's say, a, 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 a different basil plant in another pot. And so that can also be used for the sequencing of your harvest. So let's talk a little bit about um, how you might encourage the branching. And so on the left-hand side, you sort of see um, sort of the basic structure of a generic plant. Um, you have at the top what is called sort of like the apical bud or meristem. 
and that's where the plant is growing upwards. And so part of what you want to do when you harvest, I guess this is a choice, but if you cut that apical meristem off, then what happens is because there's no top to the plant, one of these like side um, nodes became, becomes a top branch. And so you, now you have two stems in the place of one. So let's sort of look at this on the right-hand side. You can see um, sort of in this fuzzy picture, a bit of the top of the basal plant. And then where that pencil is pointing is just above one of these nodes. And you can see that because they're little leaves. And so in an ideal uh, harvesting, if you're trying to maximize branching, you would cut right there just above those little leaves. And so depending on how bushy you want your plant to be, a good time to do your first um, uh, harvest might be um, when the plant is, let's say, eight inches tall, and you'd maybe cut about four inches of it off um, to, um, to, to uh, have the branching start a little lower down on the plant where it it's, um, tends to be, uh, the stem tends to be a bit stronger. And so um, that may seem like a very drastic thing to do to your plant, but you'll see after a couple of weeks that the plant will regrow two sort of stems in the place of that one, and that you would in fact have more um, branches with basal leaves um, than you would have had if you just let the plant grow straight up. And so um, let's see. So critical thing, so you can just see in this picture, we're just cutting above the node. It, it is uh, useful, to, I think, to use something relatively sharp rather than your, your fingers um, to, uh, like, to actually do the pruning because if there's less uh, tissue damage sort of at that cutting point, then the plant heals better. So you can see in this picture, pair of scissors, just snip it off there above the, the internode. And, um, and then you can either just eat that top bit or like I said, you can put that top bit into water or soil to try to propagate more plants. And um, this applies for, um, if you look at your, your plants, for a wide range of plants, like from your mints to your, your cilantros to your thyme, um, and uh, this enhances sort of the, the, the form of the plant, I guess, for productivity. So after you've cut it, it should look like something like this. And amazingly, plants, just will take a wound like that and heal, and but will not regrow from that point, but you'll, you would see it regrowing from very close to where those little leaves are in the middle. So one of the things you're trying to do when you're harvesting is to uh, prevent flowering from taking place. And so if uh, you're on top of this uh, harvesting and, and essentially pruning, then uh, it should delay uh, the course of um, the bolting, in other words, the production of that stem that has the flower. So you see it on the, the left-hand side, it's sort of at its very incipient phases. You see it flowering fully on the right-hand side. Uh, it is possible, sometimes too late, but it is possible to try to remove that, that um, bolt, uh, like you're seeing there on the left-hand side, uh, to try to keep the plant from fully forming flowers. Uh, so what's happening there is that when the flowers um, uh, start to, to form, there's an allocation of energy um, to the growth of that part of the plant. Um, the reproductive tissue can be quite energetically expensive to produce, but it's also signaling sort of for an annual plant that um, the end of the season uh, can be relatively near. And so that's why the plant sort of uh, allocates all its energy to, to the reproductive process rather than growing leaves, which uh, won't be useful when uh, winter comes along. So one of the things about bolting that's sort of fascinating is that it is not just sort of a timed thing. It act, and, and obviously harvesting changes that, but it's also very uh, weather dependent or, or I guess temperature dependent. So after a very hot period, um, for example, a couple of years ago in Edmonton, it was going to, to 35 plus degrees, the plant has, uh, um, uh, sometimes will they will trigger bolting, and um, and so if you're anticipating really hot weather, it might be nice if you're using a container to just move uh, the plants into a more shady part of your your balcony or yard, so that um, at least it's it has a chance to sort of uh, avoid most of that heat. 
So one of the things that happens with growing any plants is there's some potential for um, plant disease. Um, so this is, uh, these are sort of the most common sort of pathogens uh, I've experienced. So like this, the black splotching on the bottom left um, can be caused by different fungal pathogens uh, like downy mildews, um, the sort of stem um, blackening that you see is sometimes caused by bacteria. Um, this is both on basil plants. Um, one of the things that is important, we don't have um, as much of a problem in, in Edmonton because our air is relatively uh, not humid, uh, is to try to place the water when you're watering on the soil rather than on the leaves so that um, it, particularly in very humid environments, if you place the water on the leaf, it, it just takes a very long time for it to, to evaporate. And, and fosters the growth of sort of these microbes and stuff. Um, I personally take sort of a, a pretty uh, heavy-handed approach to, to plants when I see any signs of pathogen because I don't want it to spread. And so if I start seeing these black splotches, I would probably just remove that plant entirely. Um, I, I would probably just actually still eat the green leaves, but, but overall, um, I think that dealing with it um, as soon as possible is, is a good way to, to reduce the damage. I find um, that when I make cuttings um, from, from grocery store uh, herbs that I've bought that sort of I eat the leaves and then I put the stem in, in like a, a mason jar of water, um, that those sometimes are, are, well, they just seem to have a higher likelihood of having this sort of pathogen probably because I've stressed the plant by, by cutting it, but also because it's been out of, it, it hasn't had its roots for, for the whole process from the farm to, to uh, I guess, my, my kitchen table. So the other thing, the last thing I'd like to talk about today that I think is pretty exciting is actually growing um, your herbs as, um, as, as seeds. And so uh, this is something that is not either or, like, I think that it's nice to obviously eat um, the, the leaves along the way, but um, you can also um, think about how you might uh, keep some of the seeds for uh, either a subsequent season or as part of the successional planting that you might do. So um, if you have seeds from plants that you, you um, maybe transplanted from seedling early in the summer, then you can take those seeds and you can actually start um, producing uh, more plants um, if you have started early enough. Another thing you can do is obviously just save them for the next season. So typically what you'll see is um, the flowers have sort of dried and become very brittle. Um, that's usually a good sign that this, uh, the seeds are, have matured. Um, you can see these are basil seeds. The basil seeds are actually very delicious on their own, but you can also um, use them to to plant the next year. And so the way I typically do is I cut the um, um, stem with the, the dried flowers and the seeds uh, very gently because they tend to um, loosen and just fall to the ground. And so I might uh, um, be extremely careful not to, to shake the, the stem, cut right at the bottom. And then I just pop it often into a paper bag or a, like I just have these uh, uh, restaurant trays that I would just put uh, let the, the stem dry out a little bit more. Um, ultimately, you want the seeds separated from all the other uh, tissue of the plant because that will help reduce the chance that they get sort of um, um, spoiled um, in some way if and, and lets them dry essentially faster. Um, and so uh, with those seeds, you can just pop those into, um, yeah, like an envelope or or a, a small paper bag, or even just like a, make a little envelope with folding paper. And yeah, they, they keep really well for, um, for, for at least a couple of years, is my experience. Um, you wanna keep them generally in a cool, dark place. Uh, that's also dry, um, generally not hermetically sealed. Like you want the, the seed to essentially be able to breathe still. On um, the seeds themselves, things like dill can be used for, for pickling. Uh, coriander can obviously be used for, for cooking, but um, I think that you'd find that a lot of seeds um, are, are quite um, delicious um, in of themselves. And so collecting seeds, um, if you uh, lost control of the bolting on your plants and they've, they've flowered and all that, 
um, I think it's actually a, a nice direction to go. And it's, uh, it's also a nice way to in increase the number of seeds so that um, you can trade them with people. And um, yeah, so I, I find that yeah, if you're thinking about sort of the economics of your garden, that seeds are a very productive uh, thing to produce for, for, your, for yourself. With that, um, I would like to open it up to questions. Thank you very much for your time. Um, McEwen School of Continuing Education has lots of different courses and uh, professional development certificates, so please uh, check us out on uh, online. Um, but um, I will stay as long as you have questions today. So um, thank you for joining us. Uh, hello to everyone.